Anyway, if you have your Bibles this morning, Acts chapter 17, we come to a very interesting passage in Paul's ministry and his time in Athens. And from everything that I've read and, and can find out, apparently shortly before this time when Paul goes there, Athens was like a, maybe New York City or something, maybe Las Vegas. It was the place to go. It was the place to be. The architecture, uh, they had universities there. I mean, just, and, and as we're going to see in, in our text, that uh, that's where all the smart people went. They went there to discuss and to always, as Paul says, always share something new. And, but when Paul got there, he found it a little bit different. And it was, it was almost like it was just starting its decline. It, it, wasn't, it was still a great city, but it wasn't what it used to be. It was kind of on the decline. And so beginning in verse uh, 22, we looked at the first part of this last week, verses 16 through 21, Paul witnessing and, and how his spirit was distressed by all the idols that he saw. And I told you that one writer said that uh, it was easier to find a God in Athens than he was a man. There were so many idols, and, and uh, I found several others that thought that too. So in verse 22, Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, and I even found an altar on which was inscribed, to the unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath in all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. That, that one verse right there, verse 26, from one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. Now, I could preach on that for a couple of months, but that, that is, that's serious. And remember that Paul got his doctrine, his teaching directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you read a verse like that, not only does it speak to God's sovereignty, but to God's power that he could create this whole earth, create from one man, all nationalities, everybody, and that's literally blood. Some of your translations say blood. So what he's telling us is we're all of the same blood. Every person on the face of the earth, th there is no such thing as races. Okay? Yes, sir. We're all the same blood. There are different ethnicities, different cultures, but we're all the same blood. And then he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. And the thing that I want you to remember about that is something I've, I've told you two or three times not so long ago. You could have been born anywhere at any time, but you weren't. You were born right now in the end times right here. And there's a reason. There's a reason that you are born and you are here right now. God appointed your time and your life here. And, and the, the thing that excites me about that, first of all, is, is all of the prophecies that we're seeing come to pass right now. God put us here in the last days to be a witness to him and to share the gospel. And when you think that the Lord Jesus Christ said in, in Luke and in Matthew that as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of Son of Man. And you think about the days of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, and the Lord said in Genesis 6 that in those days violence filled the earth and every thought of man's heart was only evil continually 
And yet God chose to put me here and now to be a light in those evil times. Now, on one hand, that puts a weight, man. That, that's, that's a responsibility. But on the other hand, that's exciting that we're here for that. That's what Paul's telling us. And then he did this, verse 27, so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are all also his offspring. Verse 29, since then... We are God's offspring. We shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed, and he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him, but others said, we would like to hear more from you again about this. So Paul left their presence, and however, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius, the Aragopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Lord Jesus, help us with your word this morning. Father, just give me strength. And Father, help me to share your word in a way that would be pleasing to you and edifying to those that hear. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The thing I want to focus on this morning is that one phrase where Paul says that you, he found an idol to the unknown God. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I want to stress this point that God does not desire to be an unknown God. Even though that's what the Greeks were doing and that's what the, they wanted to make sure that they didn't miss anything. That's, they were just covering their bases. They didn't believe in any God, okay? They were just covering the bases and they were always doing that. But God doesn't desire to be an unknown God. He wants to be a saving God. He wants to be a God that is personal to each one of us. And so he has, as Paul said, made himself known. He has made it clear and obvious that there is a God and it is him. I want to share with you a couple of passages. Acts chapter 19, a lot of people quote this passage. The heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech, and night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, and there are no words, yet their voice is not heard. But their message goes out to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of the world. So God has created the world in such a way that it, it cries out of his glory. It cries out of his power. It cries out that there is a God, that this didn't just happen. And then Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, he says, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what was made. As a result, people are without excuse. So God doesn't want to be unknown. He wants people to know him. He wants people to share in his love, in his glory, in his creation, in his eternity. Now, to most of the world, he is an unknown God. And it is our purpose to make him known to them in all his glory. For most people, he is the unknown God. He is something they claim to worship like the Greeks do, but they don't know him. It's no more use to them than the wood and the stone idols are to the Greeks in Athens. When Paul got to Athens, 
the scripture says that he found them a very religious culture. Now, I want you to think about that a minute because when you read this text and you think about the Athenians and everything they were doing, yeah, religion might come to your mind and thought, but to me, they were a wicked people. A wicked people that had rejected the truth of God and they were worshiping all these pagan idols. And Paul says that they were very religious, but he said they worshiped in ignorance. They were worshiping all of these idols, all of these false gods, but they didn't really know what they were worshiping. And when it came to the true God, the unknown God for them, they certainly didn't know what they were worshiping. If you read and study, the Greek religion was more of a deification of human characteristics and human powers, okay? Now, by that I mean, from all of the stories that I've read and all of the history and the legends that I know, most of the Greek gods acted more like spoiled children than they did deities. And so for them to put so much stock in some of these gods that they had, and you remember some of the stories that you maybe were told as a kid or, or you read when you got up in school and had different reading assignments. It, it really, it, reading some of the Greek gods is like reading a nursery rhyme tale where the kid didn't get his way and, you know, and, and the, it, it just, it's ridiculous. And yet that's who these people were worshiping. And so their worship was in ignorance. Paul tells the Jews that in Romans chapter 10, you'll recall that he begins a chapter by saying that my heart's desire is that my people could come to know Jesus Christ. He even goes as far as to say that he would wish himself accursed from Christ if it meant salvation for his people. And then he said they worship God, but in ignorance. Because he said they think that they can find righteousness in the law when God has revealed his righteousness in Jesus Christ. That's the same place that these Gentiles, these Athenians find themselves. And then the second thing that I want to point, about, point out about these idols is something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 19 through 20. And there I'm not going to read it. You can read it later on this afternoon. There Paul tells us that idols, these wooden stone things they set up, these statues, that all they were were fronts for demons. Now think about that for a minute because I'm going to talk about idols and gods that we have today here in a minute. And Paul says that all they were was fronts for demons. So behind each one of these gods, behind each one of these idols or these pagan religions that they had was a demon. Now, what was that demon's purpose? What was he trying to do? Simply to keep them worshiping in ignorance so they don't find the true God. Remember what Paul said. And he said in verse 27, he did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And those demons under Satan's direction will do everything they can to keep us from finding God, to keep us from seeking God. That's why religion is so powerful and popular. And I just want to stress this to you. Everybody, everybody has a religion. You say, well, not everybody's Baptist. No, they're not. Nor Methodist, nor Catholic. Atheism <coughs> is a religion. Humanism is a religion. All of us have a religion. It's just that some religions are backed by Satan and their sole purpose is to keep those that adhere to that religious process, that thought, the thought process from finding and worshiping the true God. And that's what Paul points out to him. The problem is, even though God 
wants to be worshipped, even though God wants to be known. And, and Paul begins by telling them of God's greatness and pointing out, in verse 24, he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, he points out by telling them the truth. The God that I proclaim to you is the God that created the heaven and the earth. The God that I proclaim to you in verse 26 is the God that created you and me and gives us life and sustains life. And they know that because that's in them. The problem is, is that people suppress the truth. That's what we read in Romans chapter one, how God has revealed himself to them, but people suppress the truth of the known God because they don't want God or they don't want anyone else to rule over them. That's why there's religions. We come up with our own religions just like these Athenians came up with all of these different idols, all of these different gods, all of these different religions because if we come up with our own religion, we can, number one, we can define our own morality and number two we can excuse our actions by coming up with our religion I promise you right now if there's something that you want to do and you know it's wrong you, you, you know the Bible is against it if there's something you want to do I promise you somewhere in this world you can find a religion that will tell you it's okay. Somewhere you will find a religion that will mold itself and make itself so you can do what you want to do, feel like you want to feel, have the morals that you want to have, and tell you it's okay and you'll be all right in the long run. That's what they were doing. That's how they were worshiping. And folks, that is exactly what we do today. You say, well, we don't have idols all over the place. We, we, you know, and when you went downtown Athens, they weren't idols like just in churches. They were all over the place. Kind of like you see the Catholics riding around with their little idols on the dashboard, you know, and hanging from, the, the, they were everywhere. So it didn't matter where you went or what you did, you could find a religion somewhere. Well, I don't like what they're doing on this street. Well, go to the next one. They've got their own religion over there. And you just keep going until finally, and for, we do the same thing. We don't have idols of wood and stone, but we have just as many idols and false gods as, as they do. Not only in a religious way, as, as I talked about a couple of weeks ago, I think one of the first things God's going to do with the church is where did you come up with all of these denominations? How in the world, that, that's something Jim and I talk about every now and then. Both of us are scared to death when we get to heaven. First things God's going to say is how did you get that out of that? <laughs> and I believe a lot of people are going to, a lot of preachers, a lot of denominations are going to stand before God and God's going to say, I don't know where you got that. Folks, denominations are not of God. That's man-made. And it's man-made because we can't sit down and, and get along and read the word of God and be led by the Holy Spirit to the truth. And then it's man-made because man wants what man wants. And if he can't get it, he'll come up with it some other way. One of our grandkids was crying just squalling one time and finally she got her to quieten down enough and, and you know, what's the matter? What are you crying? She said, well, I want what I want. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way we are. That's, and now notice what he says. This is a very interesting passage. Verse 20, notice what he says. He says, therefore, Having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Having overlooked, did you know God does that? He overlooks stuff. 
I'll prove it to you in just a minute. Having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. And then here's the primary reason we have so many religions and you can find a religion somewhere that will fit you and what you want religion and the hereafter to be. Here it is. Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. And he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. That's why there's religions. You don't want to face God's judgment. You want to be able to live like you want to and do what you want to gratify the lust of your flesh and still feel like that you're going to be okay and not going to stand before God. Fine, I got a religion for that. But folks, the Bible says that there's coming a day that every one of us are going to stand before not some religious high priest, not some denominational board that, that determines policy. We're going to stand before God. And we're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. That's one thing, and I've been harping on this a little bit lately. I, I don't understand about why we are so afraid of witnessing. It doesn't matter what denomination you are or what religion you are. Either Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him, or he's a liar. One of the two. And just because our friends or our family or our neighbors happen to believe something else doesn't make it right. Either, and the religion of Scripture is the only religion in the world that claims this. And mark it, it's not us that claims it. It's Jesus that claims it. Folks, if people do not come to God by faith in the death on the cross, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are going to hell. Or God's a liar and it doesn't matter what religion we do or what we do. Amen? Yes, sir. It can't be both. It's either one or the other, and that's why people do what they do to salve their conscience, to try to get out of this. But notice what he said. I'll, I'll get back to this because I told you I'd prove it. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. What he is actually talking about is the Old Testament and the sacrificial system with the Jews. Because of that, God overlooked their sin and overlooked what they were doing until all of that was fulfilled in Christ. But there is a sense also to that where with the Gentiles, as Paul is preaching to here, and with you and me, that, that God overlooks our sin for the time being. You see, you think you're getting away with it. You think, well, that must be okay because I know what the Bible says and I know the preacher said that, that this is a sin and we shouldn't do it, but, but I'm doing it and everything's okay. Wrong. You're doing it because God is overlooking it right now. And every one of us ought to say, thank you, Lord, because if he didn't overlook it, you know what that would mean? Instant judgment. You sin, judgment. That's what he's talking about. He said, no, he said right now, you think all of these gods, you think all of these religions, you think everything that you're doing, that, that's good and that's right because 
nothing's happened. That's what the Israelites said. That's one of the things Isaiah spent three chapters getting on to them about. You think because you're God's people, judgment hadn't come on you because of your drunkenness and your idolatry and you're, you're oppressing everybody. He said, that ain't it. He said, God's given you opportunity. And that's what Peter tells us in the New Testament today. That's why I don't have a problem applying this to you and me today. Peter said, the Lord is not slow concerning his promises. Some count slowness, but he is patient with you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I want to tell you, I'm going to preach on this, I think, next Sunday. I'm going to skip Acts for one Sunday. Repentance is not only for sinners. And lost people, repentance is for you and me each and every day. Turning to God, seeking God, that's what Paul stresses to them. Listen, just because you, you've gotten away with it all these years, I, I would thank God right now that he is patient and that he has overlooked it and he has given you opportunity. Because now that you've heard this message, he may decide, time's up. Today is the day of salvation. Even though God has revealed himself and made this evident to people, Paul tells us nobody has an excuse. Nobody. Even though all of that is true. The Bible still says this in Matthew chapter 7, enter by the narrow gate. Because broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that enter in. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life and few enter in that way. And the number one reason that few people find the straight and narrow is religion. False gods and false idols, just like what they were doing in Athens. And I'm not saying that the Baptist religion is, is the only religion. I covered that a couple of weeks ago. I, the only reason I'm Baptist is because I think we're the closest. Again, I, we've got some major issues, and I don't mind pointing them out when I get a chance. But my statement stands. Either Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him, or He's not. And if he's not, then we're all free to come up with whatever we want. But if he is, and he is, then none of us are free. We are free in Christ to worship God and to serve him, but we're not free to come up with our own. So here's my last word. To the world, as I said in the beginning, he is the unknown God. And it is our purpose to make him known to them. Because not only has he overlooked our sin and hadn't brought immediate judgment on us, he hasn't taken us to heaven yet. And there's a reason for that. And it's not to set in here on our blessed assurance. It's to carry the gospel to a lost and dying world. One last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says that we therefore have been made ambassadors to preach the word of Jesus Christ. And he says this. He says that it is as though God himself were speaking through us. We are to be mouthpieces for God. We are to be instruments of God's grace and glory to reach out to a lost and dying world. 
And to me, it's like salvation. Either Jesus is the only way or he's not. And if you say, yes, he's the only way, then either you serve him or you don't. And if you don't, I'd be looking over my shoulder because there's no telling when that appointed day might come. Amen? Amen. Don't worship in ignorance. Don't worship in ignorance. He's left us his word and we can know the truth. Let's stand. Father, I just thank you for the time we've had together. Lord, I ask your forgiveness. Father, not only for Spring Hill, but for churches in general for what we've become and what we've allowed to happen. And Lord, we haven't presented a unified body to the world. When they look at us, rather than seeing oneness as they see in you and the Father, they see many. And that's a lot of the reason that they think about you the way that they do. Forgive us, Father. Help us to repent of our sin, our wrongdoing, and help us to have courage to share your word with those around us. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning.